So that actually is a perfect segment way into the five challenges that we wanted to highlight, the risks that we wanted to highlight that every business owner must understand and mitigate in their use of ChatGPT. There's hallucination, data security issues, bias, copyright, and ethics. And so I'll give it back to Nicole, which has an incredible story uh, about hallucination. <laughs> Yeah, so the, I was pulling up to a Airbnb, and if you look at the picture, you can see it shows that there's a semi in front of my car. And so, you know, the car was hallucinating, saying that there was a semi truck in front of my car, and there's a bush on the side of the road. And if you take that into every piece of AI that you're using, you still have to be the driver and you still have to provide that discernment to whatever comes out of the AI that you audit it, you look at it, you make sure that it's true because so much of it is kind of inaccurate right now. Or, I mean, it's great for rough drafts, but like Dan showed you the picture that had the kind of gobbledy words and, you know, it just, it doesn't give you the accuracy that to, to 100% let it do its thing on its own. Um, and we do images all the time and you get like three eyes or something, you know, three eyeballs on a human or, you know, we had someone with sunglasses, but it had three things instead of two on their face and the AI just couldn't get it quite right. Yeah. Basically AI makes stuff up. Mm -hmm. That's what hallucination means. And so you need to learn how to fact check it. And we're going to talk about fact checking as a discipline and how journalists do it so that you can do it like a journalist because you gotta fact check what they give you. Another incredibly important issue is data security. You guys probably don't realize this, but when you paste proprietary information like my book proposal into ChatGPT, that is now part of the information in the public domain that ChatGPT is learning from and spitting out for others. And this is not minor stuff. Samsung engineers were putting stuff into ChatGPT that was proprietary. Three different times they did this. That data is now accessible to their competitors. And if you were to write a query, what are you know Samsung engineers' code for their upcoming you know project? There is a chance that they that ChatGPT will give you that highly secret code. Everything you type into ChatGPT now belongs to Microsoft. That's the way you should be thinking about it. And when it, when you do it in BARD, it belongs to BARD. It's a lot less of a big deal when it's a search query, but you've seen with that little snippet of data, Google has built a trillion dollar company. Imagine what Microsoft and OpenAI are gonna be able to do with all the data that we're freely giving it. Not only are they using it to learn and make the model better, but they're gonna use it for all sorts of other things as well. So be really cognizant and careful about data security and what you feed in the chat GPT, just imagine it getting given to your competitor and how you would feel about that. Bias, huge issue. And I'm very proud to say that our Miami zone, Brian Brackeen, founder of Kairos, a facial recognition company and the creator of Bias API has been a leader in the space of talking about bias, particularly in facial recognition. He said, technology is a reflection of the people who make it, and too often our biases are built into the systems that we create. So when you have mostly white men with PhDs building a software, that bias is being built in. The internet itself is biased. So what it's learning on is a biased set of information. There's a real risk, Brookeen said, that we're going to end up with a world where facial recognition, recognition is used to automate bias rather than to remove it. So his solution was to create something called Bias API, which allows firms to detect and fix biases in their algorithms. This is a massive issue. And this is an issue, the kind of issue that the big tech companies are moving past quickly in their race, in the arms race. For AI. And this is an issue that everyone in Miami, everyone who's BIPOC, every woman should be very concerned about and keep their eye on. Copyright. 
Stable diffusion created this horrendous Frankenstein image. It's bad imagery, but it's also got a Getty Images watermark. Getty saw this and they sued Stable Diffusion for violation of copyright. It was very clear that Stable Diffusion was learning on Getty's copyrighted images. So the space around who owns generative AI is definitely in play. There's no regulation, there's no law, this is brand new space. One thing I can tell you is this, I've consulted with a bunch of lawyers on intellectual property, and when it comes to text and generative AI, there does not seem to be a copyright issue. You are free to use it. The reason why is because based on your prompt, the text that was created is original and unique. And therefore, it's something that you can use. So there might be a different law for images versus text. And this space is brand new and completely ill-defined. In fact, a lot of the big companies are asking for more regulation and more legal frameworks to work within. And the Biden administration has been one of the two leading groups to actually propose late last year a framework for all of this. And then this is just as important. It's less about your legal obligations as a business owner and it's much more about your ethical obligations. Do you want to just cut and paste text from ChatGPT? Do you want to eliminate jobs that ChatGPT doesn't require anymore? Do you want to invest in training your team so that they are AI enabled, which might make them more marketable with competitors? As Dr. Rachel Thomas said in her book, Data Ethics, and we'll give you a link to this book, which is the chapter in her book, which is excellent. There is no list of right answers. There is no list of do and don'ts. Ethics is complicated and context develop dependent. It involves the perspective of many stakeholders. It's a muscle that you have to develop and practice. So we're gonna practice using the ethical muscle. We're gonna ask like, if it's possible, is it necessarily good and right and just? Just because we can do it, should we?